All right, I, I know what you're thinking. What are you, noted professor of history, Benjamin Siegel, doing on the floor with a Mesoamerican pre-Columbian metate mano? I know, it's the obvious question. Well, there's a couple of explanations. First of all, some years, you and your spouse, noted anthropologist Caterina Scaramelli, decide that you're not going to do anything for your birthdays. There's going to be no presents. And so your birthday rolls around, and what do you get? Well, of course, inside your office, there's this massive pre-Columbian tool that weighs 50 pounds, and you can't lift, and you can barely lift it up, so you try to find a place for it, and so it lives in your office forever, and it never really goes into the kitchen, and you're not really sure what the present was about anyway. But that's besides the point. In fact, the reason the mitate and mano entered into our house is because we spent a lot of time thinking about this, a tortilla. Of course, you know what a tortilla is. You buy them at the store, maybe a Latin market. They're, they're round, they're perfect, they're beautiful. Well, making a tortilla prior to the invention of the mechanical tortilla press used to be an incredible feat. In fact, it was one of the most fundamental, unique, and organizing principles of pre-Columbian American cooking. And we decided that we were going to try it ourselves. So where do you start? Well, of course, first you have to grow the corn. So. Around this time last year, we looked at the Southern Exposure Seed Exchange catalog and picked out a couple of varieties of native heirloom corn that we were going to grow at home in our front yard in Jamaica Plain. The variety that we ended up growing is called Cherokee Long Ears Small. So we sowed our seed in the front yard, and in the fall we... And by August, we had a beautiful harvest of corn. Here's a couple of our beauties. You can see they don't look anything like the sweet corn you might buy in New England. They're absolutely gorgeous. This one's a kind of russet red. This has a beautiful purple hue to it. This has a speckled orange yellow. Beautiful corn. Now the next step, of course, if you're gonna make tortillas, is to get lime. In fact, corn by itself is pretty hard to digest. You may eat it as a vegetable, but it's not very digestible by human beings. And actually, you don't get many of the minerals or vitamins that you could otherwise get from it. In Mesoamerica, in pre-antiquity, humans figured out how to release some of those minerals and vitamins from corn by using substances like lime. This was a process called nixtamalization. It made corn from something that was broadly indigestible into something that was really nutritious and filling, particularly when you supplemented it with things like beans and tomatoes and chilies. So what did we do to get our lime? We went on to the Everything Free Jamaica Plain mailing list and we found someone who was giving away some of their extra lime. They're a Jamaica Plain. Anyhow, last night I got this all together and I started the process of nixtamalization. You take corn and you soak it in a mixture of water and lime. You boil it and then you let it sit overnight. And then the husks are released from the corn. And you get something that looks a little bit like this. These swollen kernels of corn which are, gonna be, which are ready to be transformed into a delicious tortilla. So I think we should give it a shot. Let's get started. All right, we'll just take some of this corn right here. Grinding, okay. This is not good. Wow, this is really hard. I'm not quite sure if I'm making progress, so you're gonna have to give me a little bit of time. While I work on this, I'm gonna have you have a look at the most important transformation in human culinary history. The exchange of crops, peoples, and pathogens between the old world and the new world. Let's get that started, and I'll work on grinding. Hey everyone and welcome back. You've all heard, I'm sure, about the story of Columbus and his alleged discovery of the New World, along with the genocide that came afterwards. But today we're going to zero in on one particular aspect of that famous voyage and the impact that it had on humans on both sides of the Atlantic. When Columbus went off to the New World in 1492 looking for a new route to the Spice Islands, he began a fundamental transformation in the eating habits of all human beings. There wouldn't be a person on Earth who wasn't left affected. There, of course, were immediate biological and environmental consequences of contact between Europe and the New World. They were dramatic and traumatic. An exposure to Old World diseases killed more than 80% of the New World population within 100 years. And assisted with this kind of germ warfare, Spanish conquistadors were able to subdue these incredible, vast Aztec, Mayan, and Inca empires. There were strong ecological transformations afterwards. 
European plants and animals flourished in spaces that were left open by demographic decline, and the ecology of Amer the Americas were remade. Let's focus today on some of those transformations and what happened afterwards, not just in the Americas, but also in the Old World. We'll start by looking at a number of Old World food regimes to see what kind of food regimes Columbus and his crew arrived to. There were some real fundamental differences between Old World and New World agricultural regimes. The biggest one, of course, was that in the New World there really were no beasts of burden. There were no domesticated animals except for some turkeys and a number of small dogs. Native Americans in North and South and Central America did really well foraging for protein, but they still depended for the most part on maize, their staple grain, for calories. Human labor was indispensable in the absence of animals. It was women who ground maize by hand and men carried heavy loads up on their backs across long distances. The introduction of livestock by Spanish conquistadors had the potential to improve livelihoods by reducing some of that human burden but it also posed tremendous ecological danger, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that today. We'll zero in on the Mesoamerican maize complex, this system of growing corn that provided the foundation for a basically fully vegetarian diet. Zia maize, which we know as corn, gave carbohydrates and almost 80% of the total calories that old world Americans were eating, while beans added protein and amino acids, and it made something like a complete protein set when everything was eaten together. Everything was made a little more interesting by the introduction of things like chili and squash, tomato, and avocados. It also gave vitamins and minerals. And Native Americans across the Americas supplemented this vegetarian cuisine by eating any animal protein they could scavenge. Things like deer, ducks, rabbits, seafood, rodents, insects, even lake algae. Let's zero in on what Native Americans did with corn. The indigenous techniques for making maize tortillas were intensely labor-intensive. Mesoamerican women, and it was all women, first simmered kernels into a mineral solution. That loosens an indigestible husk and it releases niacin, which is a vitamin necessary to avoid a disease called pellagra. Then you hand grind that wet dough, which is called nixtamal, and you do it on a grinding stone. You break it down piece by piece. And afterwards, you pat that small dough, or rather women would pat that small dough, into thin round tortillas and cook them briefly. You've seen this on an earthenware griddle. Tortillas don't stick around long. If you've had a tortilla that's just a couple days old, you know. It goes stale quickly. And nixtamal ferments overnight. So women would have to get up before dawn to cook for men who were going to work in the fields. There were midwives who warned girls upon their birth about the drudgery and the tiredness that would result from grinding maize all the time. We see in Mesoamerica that this kind of drudgery associated with grinding stone instilled a very deep sense of patriarchy in Mesoamerica, and that soon formed the basis for a large social hierarchy. There were really only limited supplies of food, and so social hierarchies governed food distribution. We see this in archeological remains. Well-fed nobles in Mesoamerica were about 10 centimeters taller than commoners in the Mayan city of Tikal. There were frequent famines. We saw famines in the years before Columbus arrived. And we also saw the emergence of something that we'd call kind of a moral economy, which we're gonna talk about later. Montezuma the Elder, when there was a big famine in the 15, 1450s, used canoes to give maize to starving people. And in later years, there was a holiday called the Great Feast of the Lords, which recalled the beneficence of Montezuma through the ceremonial handouts of tamales that were handed out via canoes to recall that act of social munificence. Food played a tremendous role in sacrifice and tribute. For the Aztecs, there was a large set of rituals that demanded the tribute of food and other goods from subjects of the empire, particularly in its most fertile regions. And if you look to the warrior elite, civil and religious banquets were really competitive. Hosts would compete to serve the finest chili pepper stews, tamales, and chocolate. Spanish conquistadors, when they arrived, would speak with awe about the lavish dishes that were served daily to Montezuma the Younger, who ruled between 1502 and 1520. When the Spaniards arrived in America, they were disgusted by Native American foods and vice versa. Montezuma's ambassadors said that European bread tasted no better than dried maize stalks. And Bernal Diaz de Castillo complained of the misery of maize cakes that served as daily rations for him and his troops. 
Indigenous Americans said that pork fat was one of the most horrible things that they had tasted, and the Spanish brought pigs along to breed along the way. And the Spaniards were disgusted by Mesoamerican consumption of rodents and insects, which they called animalitos. Catholic missionaries played central roles in this kind of culinary imperialism. They were eager to grow wheat in the New World to replace maize gods with the sacrifice of the Eucharist. But peasants in Mesoamerica found that that kind of grain didn't really grow well in America. It was expensive and it was prone to disease and rot, even though some entrepreneurial Mesoamericans sold it in urban markets. But maybe the most devastating thing was the arrival of European livestock. Cattle and sheep reproduced at exponential rates in the American countryside, and they began running over once productive land. There was a combination of the growth of livestock and the collapse of human population owing to disease, and so it kind of seemed that human beings were being replaced by animals. For a couple of decades in the mid-16th century, Mexico City's markets were overflowing with meat. But as grazing went on unchecked, herbivores soon exceeded the carrying capacity of the land. They exposed the soil to erosion, and they made it unfit for farming or herding. Sheep turned the fertile Mezquital Valley into a desert within just a couple of decades, and by the end of the century, meat became scarce once again in the New World. But in spite of all this disgust and this revulsion that Spaniards and Mesoamericans had for each other, there was already kind of a culinary fusion occurring taking place. While indigenous cooks held on tightly to their staple grain of maize, Native cooks learned to whip pork fat into tamales, and they gave everything a lighter texture and a richer flavor. Spanish settlers acquired eventually this taste for things like beans and chili peppers, even though they continued to pay really high prices for wheat bread that was familiar to them. This kind of cultural blending was extensive in Mesoamerica, but it also took place further south in South America. And we'll look next to the Inca Empire in modern-day Peru. If you think about the Andes Mountains, they rise up in kind of terraced fields. And there's separate ecological niches at every altitude that give a wealth of different foodstuffs. Much of Peru, of course, is coastal. And so there were complex societies that were harvesting fish and shellfish as early as 2500 before the Common Era in the desert areas on the Pacific coast, where there's a lot of fog, but really no rain, so not a lot of agriculture. But further up, Peru kind of turns into a mountainous region. And in the highland valleys, the Mesoamerican maize complex coexisted with the Andean grain, which you've probably tasted. It's called quinoa. If you go even further above the rainy zone, above the tree line, human settlements in Peru and the Inca Empire depended on potatoes and other root crops like uca and uloco. And at the highest elevations, there was one particularly important domestic animal, the llama. The llama is a domesticated camel-like creature, and it was used to trade goods up and down the mountains. And there were also alpacas, which are smaller and gave wool to the people of, people of the Inca Empire. The Inca Empire also had a very important chemical substance, narcotic, coca leaves. They were chewed as a stimulant by people living in the highlands long before the creation of modern cocaine. So as you can see, the Inca Empire had a lot of different foods, and the exchange between people living at diverse climates became a central aspect of the diet and lives of the people of the Andes. To transport food across big distances without spoiling, Andean cooks developed a couple of different techniques for preservation. In the highlands, farmers exposed potatoes to frost and sun, and so they freeze-dried potatoes and made something tough called chuño, which would keep for long periods of time. Shepherds took llama meat, they dried it, and made something called charqui, which we get the modern-day word jerky from, and they cooked blood down into gruel that looked a little bit like British-style blood pudding. Meanwhile, from the coastal lowlands, there were salted and sun-dried fish that could be traded across long distances. There was one other particularly cute form of sustenance, the guinea pig. It was an important source of animal protein in the Inca Empire. It reproduced so quickly that you didn't really need to preserve it. You'd just keep it alive and boil it or roast it when you needed it. Andean women also boiled and toasted maize, but they didn't grind it in the same way that their Mexican or Mesoamerican counterparts did. And so women were able to work as shepherds and farmers, they could plant and harvest potatoes, and men turned the soil with smaller plows. And so as a result, there was a greater sense of gender equity in Peru and in the Inca Empire than in Mexico, in the home of the Aztec Empire. The Inca Empire had a highly productive economy. 
and big traditions of reciprocity. And so leaders there were able to organize labor and redistribute wealth for the benefit of the entire community. It was a massive empire. It stretched over 3,000 kilometers between Ecuador and Chile. And the Inca Empire was structured around ideas of maximum efficiency. Sometimes this took on a kind of extreme quality. There were entire highland villages that were resettled at lower elevations by the Inca emperors with the idea of increasing the production of maize to feed a bigger population. This was a sophisticated form of population management among the Incas. Of course, the Incas were not impervious to the kind of destruction and imperialism that had destroyed Mexico as well. But because they had prior pastoral experience, they could mitigate a lot of the environmental damage that came from the Colombian exchange. The Spaniards were brutal in the Inca Empire as well. They looted warehouses, they seized treasure, and they sold off foodstuff. And right after the arrival of the Spaniards to Peru, within a decade, people were starving in Cusco, even though population had declined rapidly. Disease hit humans, but also animals, and the llama population declined. Inca shepherds were really good at culling down animals who were infected with new forms of livestock disease, but after the breakdown of Inca administration, the disease spread really quickly, and, and two-thirds of Peru's llamas and alpacas were killed very quickly after the Spanish arrival. The new Spanish administrators of Peru ordered Andean sheep herds to tend cattle and sheep instead of llamas and alpacas, and this was a policy that at least gave some kind of employment to indigenous farmers. But Spaniards often used animals as a form of biological warfare. They would turn livestock loose to damage indigenous fields and irrigation to claim the, the land for their own uses so that they could grow things like wheat and sugarcane. In post-conquest Mexico and Peru, we see the development of really divergent food habits. Both of these places became really productive centers for European agriculture. And there were small, diverse ecological niches that supported wheat, sugarcane, and livestock. But some things only worked in one place, but not the other. If we go to Peru, there were two other mainstays of the Mediterranean diet, olive oil and wine, that never really took off in Mexico. What's interesting is that both the climates of Mexico and Peru theoretically could have supported olive making and wine making. They tried to grow wine in Mexico, but unpredictable frost brought that project to a quick halt. It's probably not the result of a trade policy either, but our biggest hypothesis is that colonists in Mexico really began to like the kind of substitutes that they were eating in Mexico, things like pork fat and hot chocolate, alongside chili and beans. In both Peru and Mexico, indigenous nobles claimed status by adopting European foods. But for most Mexicans and Peruvians, commoners continued to eat their preferred staples, things like maize and potatoes, and they accepted imports and new foods only at the margins of their diet. Things like antichugos or grilled beef heart, became a street food that was beloved by many Peruvians, but it wasn't a central part of the diet. We've talked a lot about the transformations of the New World cuisines, but what about the ways in which American crops transformed the Old World? Let's get to that. Christopher Columbus, of course, had been trying to find spices. But in America, he found foods that gave far more benefits than the Asian spices he was originally looking for. Europeans, though, were really slow at picking up some of the benefits from these new culinary resources. Instead of immediately going back to Europe and to Iberia, where these foods were initially brought, these crops moved. They were brought by Spanish and Portuguese merchants to the Middle East and to Africa and to Asia. And it would take hundreds of years before any of these foods became popular anywhere in Europe. There's a number of factors that help determine the spread of new crops in different places. Questions of productivity, fit within agricultural regimes, the ease of preparation, how well you can adapt it to an existing culinary system, and of course, the cultural associations that a given food has. One of the most important things we can see is the reception of maize in the old world. Maize is the most versatile and productive plant that was domesticated in the Americas. Columbus brought it back to Spain just a year after he went to America for the first time in 1493. But Maize didn't have the gluten that you'd need to make a European-style bread. And so it was prepared as porridge, and it was considered to be basically something you would eat just in a famine. In 1597, John Gerard said that it was a more convenient food for swine than men, and really it was used to feed a lot of livestock. But maize actually diffused really rapidly in the Middle East, where porridges formed up a big part of the staple diet. 
Corn arrived to Lebanon and Syria in the 1520s, and it helped spur an incredible population growth under the Ottoman Empire's Suleiman the Great. As a result, many Europeans called maize the Turkish grain, while in India it was known as Mecca corn. So sometimes you hear this in Persian as maki in a lot of different languages that derive from Persian. The Portuguese took corn and they brought it to West Africa, where it quickly outpaced the productivity of things like millet and sorghum. Shortly afterwards, corn arrived in northern India, and then it went through the inland Chinese provinces of Yunnan and Sichuan by the 17th century. One thing that Old World cooks never did was pick up the New World tradition of nixtamalization. That's something that remained really specific to Mesoamerica. Old World cooks prepared maize using familiar methods. They roasted it on the cob like a vegetable. Sometimes they ground it into flour for porridge, or in China, it was often made into noodles. Chili peppers are another kind of exercise in contrast here. Maybe it's unsurprising, but they spread most quickly in cuisines where spices were already liberally used. Colonists in Spanish America quickly developed a taste for the chili sauces or moles made by indigenous cooks. But Western Europeans, who mostly ate things like powdered cinnamon or nutmeg or pepper, really didn't want to touch chilies. It burned their hands, their mouths, it seemed unpleasant to eat. So chili didn't really go to Europe, but instead it went first to India. Chilies were introduced to India by Portuguese traders, and they fit really naturally into the different types of masalas or spices that were prepared and generically called curry by Europeans. And areas within India's cultural orbit, places like Thailand, were also quick to adopt these new ingredients. And they were carried overland on the Silk Road to Sichuan and Yunnan, which, if you know Chinese cuisine, are places which are really known for spicy foods. Chili did make it to Europe, but it still took a while. First it went to Turkey, and then to neighboring Hungary, where people became really fond of a chili pepper that they called paprika. Chilies also went to Africa as a complement to spices that were traveling around the Indian Ocean world in the same period. A lot of the differences in reception can be explained by social conditions. And it's good for us to compare two big Asian case studies, first China and then India. China's population was growing immensely throughout the early modern world. But by the last years of the Ming Dynasty, between the 14th century and the 17th century, its agriculture was at its ecological limits, and there was the outbreak of famines in the late Ming Dynasty. Peasants, against the backdrop of famine, were really quick to adopt American staple foods, particularly the sweet potato, which gave multiple crops in a given year and had a greater caloric yield than even rice. It wasn't really hard to grow, you didn't have to maintain patty, and you could cultivate a sweet potato on even really bad land. Sweet potatoes were easily adapted into Chinese cuisine. They could be baked, boiled, mashed, ground into flour, and then made into noodles or porridge. They became a fixture of lots of meals in South China at the end of the Ming Dynasty. China was also quick to adopt other American staples like maize and peanuts. These crops complemented as opposed to replaced the existing crop rotations, and so agricultural productivity was transformed by the introduction of American staples. But the story is a little different in India. There, when we think about the Mughal Empire, they ruled over a more mobile society. There was a lot of available land, and population growth was actually pretty slow. Farmers didn't really have a big incentive to intensify their production, and so they basically ignored American foods like maize and potatoes until the 19th century, when colonial famines made it inevitable. All right, I've been grinding in the meantime, and I haven't really made a whole lot of progress. Maybe you're not surprised, but this is really, really hard. So while I keep on trying to make this tortilla and try to make this masa, I wanted to put us in conversation with one of the most important voices in Native American foodways in the modern world. Lois Ellen Frank is an American food historian. She's a cookbook author, a culinary anthropologist, and an educator. In 2003, she won a James Beard Foundation Award for her cookbook, Foods of the Southwest Indian Nations. That was the first major cookbook of Native American cuisine, and it turned her into a legend in the field of Native American culinary traditions. I had a conversation with Dr. Frank about her work and about the state of Native American foods today. Here's what she had to say. My name is Lois Ellen Frank, and I'm from the Kiowa Nation on my mom's side, and I'm Sephardic on my dad's side. My mom always had a garden. She really instilled in us, I think before, before any of these Western terms, she 
was putting eggshells and scraps, under, growing things. And I think she instilled that everything is connected to everything else. We had zucchini and we had tomatoes. So I was like, I'm going to take this zucchini and I'm going to make it into these little breads, the little meat on our little stand as kids. I was probably 10 or 11 and they sold like we sold out. And then I made them a to realize was that when you take something and you add value to it, uh, it becomes more valuable. That's when I, I knew that I wanted to be a chef. I wanted to work with food. So I did go to culinary school and then I went out West uh, and they said I would never be an executive chef because I was a woman. I switched gears and I, what came naturally to me was to photograph food. So I became a food photographer and I moved to Los Angeles. So in the early 1990s, I started to look at what I was graphing and what I was telling people to eat. And it was all foods that I didn't eat. It was who has money to pay a food photographer. And so I began to have internal ethical issues and knew I wanted to cooking and health and wellness. And again, that native what is this native cuisine? I left Los Angeles and moved to Santa Fe. I went to New York and pitched doing a cookbook. And I was told again, that native people didn't have a cuisine. And so I got my master's and then I did go on to do my doctorate is the discourse and practice of native American cuisine and native American cooks. My PhD has been woven through everything I do, whether it's consulting work with the New Mexico Department of Health or a cultural physicians committee in Washington, DC on health and wellness in native communities. I have a catering company called Red Mesa Cuisine. We specialize in indigenous cultural education. If all you want to do is eat, then we're the wrong people. You just can't have food without being educated about what you're eating. And it's been uh, really interesting to be able to work with native and non-native organizations and use food as a tool to educate. So we have the pre-contact years, virtually undisturbed, although we do know that native people traded and they traded extensively. Scientists analyzed ceramics in Chaco Canyon and anywhere from a thousand years to 2000 years ago, chocolate was in Chaco Canyon, which is in New Mexico. We know that quinoa was being grown about 2000 years ago in North Dakota. There were ingredients that did not exist anywhere outside of corn, beans, squash, potato, vanilla, and cacao. That means that the Italians did not have the tomato. The Irish did not have the potato. The Brits did not have their famous fish and chip dish, no chilies in any East Indian curries. The French had no confection using either vanilla or chocolate, which we usually refer to as the sweet sisters because they're always together. So foods from the old world get introduced here. Native world forever. So what gets introduced? All the domesticates, sheep, beef, chickens, and probably the biggest and most profound, the byproducts. None of that existed. Native people hunted wild game and wild game alone, paid really for transportation here in what is now the United States. So no dairy. Maybe Native people were bison and tried to approach them and milk them, but the truth is those wild animals are going to either run away or charge no dairy. And now you can look at the Navajos with sheep and how sheep is part of their identity. And then of course, wheat and wine. Hundreds of years after we see the impact of these introduced foods. And then we see the 1800s, we see immigrant expansion. We see the US government forming the BIA and forcibly forced, right? Native people off their their homelands, we see the tears, we see native land shrinking and shrinking, we see reservations, we see the long walk. Say you're a tribe in the Cape, along the Cape, everything. How to harvest mussels and lobster and 
all the seafood that is there. And if you get picked up and moved to Oklahoma, how do you know how, what to eat or how to hunt or how to harvest? You don't. And this is the beginning of what we call the government issue. And this period is the period where the government issued basically army rations. Some scholars, including myself, have used the term nutritional genocide. So the government issue period is flour, lard, sugar. So the, the fry bread is born from this period, as is the Indian taco. So pan Indian foods, fry bread is born and it's survival food, right? The, the ancestors made something from nothing to sustain themselves. And every culture has something that's fried and, and, and it's delicious. And if you do eat it every day, you're going to see health disparities. So the health disparities so that brings us to the last category or the fourth period. And I call that American cuisine. And this period is actually using foods from the past forward to the future. And for the first time in history, native communities get to do this on their own terms, in their own cooks. And so if a community wants to serve fry bread, that becomes their decision. Some communities promote no fry fry bread. So we take the same dough and we grill it instead of fry it. Some contemporary chefs do only pre-colonial, right? So pre-colonial, that pre-contact period, but that means no olive oil. That means no citrus. If you want to eat your way through history, I can make you a piece of fry bread and then I can educate you on what that fry bread means. I want to acknowledge the ancestors that made it and created it as a survival food, the school that if it helps to educate, then it's an important part of the culinary process of understanding Native American cuisine. Food sovereignty is a non-Native term. It's a Euro-Western academic term. So the People have the right to sufficient, healthy, culturally appropriate food. So what is that? It's food justice. It's being able to grow your own food, harvest your own food, whether it's cultivated or wild. It's how do you harvest a camas bulb? How do you harvest the wild sumac, pine nuts? It's about communities being able to produce, grow, and harvest their own food, as well as buy these foods from other Native vendors and growers. So a Native ideological, it reaches us to our land, our community, and our culture. There's a Native food movement. What does that mean? Land restaurant. We need seeds. We need farming. We need wild food gathering. So we need access. And then once you start to reintroduce and revitalize these, you revitalize everything associated with them. So for instance, then buy a pound of wild rice from Minnesota, it's much bigger than the wild rice. In order to have wild rice, you need lakes. In order for the rice to grow on the lakes, you have to have a clean land with a lake for the rice. Then you have to canoe, build the canoe. Where do you harvest the birch? How do you build the canoe? What are the songs? What are the prayers? How do you know it? How do you hull it? How do you do all of these things? And so all of this gets revitalized when you buy one pound of hand harvested wild rice from a native community. So all you have to do is go online and say, harvested wild rice and buy it from a native community. And what are you supporting? Everything associated with that rice, including the environment, we want land. We want knowledge. Everyone and as many people as possible. We want the ability and the right to these foods. And then education starting as young as two, three, four, and going all the way to 104. I choose to take the knowledge and live in a good way and use it in a way and acknowledge the ancestors and make a difference every day. 
So the Columbian Exchange, of course, was this pivotal event in human society. It transformed the foodways of the old world and the new world. But it didn't do so evenly. And foods and different food regimes were changed and spread in very different ways in different places. The differential labor regimes of indigenous North America, Mesoamerica, and South America were differentially impacted by the arrival of the conquistadors and the introduction of new forms of agriculture, new ingredients, and new livestock. And in the same way, old world populations were impacted really differently by the arrival of new ingredients from the new world. Europeans were actually pretty slow to adopt new, new ingredients, while Asians and Africans were much quicker to do that, even as there was regional differentiation. This is going to provide us a really good base for talking about the transformation of foods in the modern world. So we'll get back to that next time. Well, I've been grinding for an hour. I've barely gotten anywhere. My goal of making a tortilla took an entire year and I've been foiled at the very last minute. Um, from now on, I think it's store-bought tortillas for me. Thanks for watching. See you next time.